So Matt and Kristen asked me to give the, uh, the Porkfest commencement address. Um, and, uh, and what I'm, I, I decided to talk about this evening is uh, the New Hampshire way. So I'm going to start off uh, by asking, what did, the, uh, what did the New Hampshireman say to the Free Stater? <laughs> what else? <laughs> What took you so long? <laughs> what did the Free Stater say to the New Hampshireman? <laughs> waiting for 20,000. <laughs> Actually, a lot of us are not waiting for 20,000. We've got a <laughs> myself included. We've got a lot of different types of people here at Porkfest. Uh, a lot of different relationships to the Free State Project. Uh, we've got uh, pre-staters. Yeah. It's here for the pre-staters, people who uh, support the Free State Project, but either were born in New Hampshire or moved here for reasons other than the, the Free State Project. Pre-staters are, you guys are welcome. We appreciate you. We've got uh, Free State Project participants who've moved, early movers. It's here for the early movers. I see quite a few in the audience. We've got uh, Free State Project participants who have not yet moved, but intend to move. Let's hear it for the FSP participants. That's right. 20,000. Or maybe not. Maybe jobs. More likely jobs. That was, that was my, my issue. We can deal with that. And we also appreciate our friends of the Free State Project. We've got friends of the Free State Project here. I'd like the Friends of the Free State Project to stand. If there are Friends of the Free State Project here who are not participants yet. Uh, you, all right. Sir, I am going to give you a statement of intent right now. No pressure. Just take it. You don't have to do anything with it. <laughs> Thank you very much. But we appreciate our friends, even if, even if you can't make it to New Hampshire. Any and all support in this historic endeavor is welcome. But all these groups of people, Friends of the Free State Project, early movers, FSP participants, uh, pre-staters, I think there's actually one reason why all of you are here. Why are you here at Porkfest? Hope? Yeah? I think, I think there's one reason that unites all of us to see the Liberty community in action, right? That's what Porkfest is about. Whether you're just hanging out at campsites, talking to people, talking philosophy, talking whatever, going to Agora Valley, buying goods and services, maybe with Bitcoin, maybe with cash, maybe with silver, maybe goods and services that, uh, how shall we put this, are maybe not in, encompassed in uh, our great state's uh, statutes as uh, entirely uh, legal. Um, <coughs> you're seeing the, the Liberty Community in Action. If you're going to panels, seeing what people here in New Hampshire are doing, uh, if you're learning about everything from beekeeping to Bitcoin to dancing, you're seeing what we're doing. It's not just a political community, it's, it's a social community. Right? It's, we're, we're learning from each other, we're helping each other. And what I'd like to impress upon all of you um, who are maybe here from other places and you're considering moving to New Hampshire is that New Hampshire is America's cradle of liberty. New Hampshire is, whether you know it or not, your homeland. New Hampshire is the libertarian homeland. What I'm going to do now is prove that to you by taking a tour through New Hampshire's past, present, and future. So New Hampshire was settled by adventurous pioneers who scaled the alpine peaks of Mount Washington, established Dartmouth College as a light in the wilderness, platted and settled towns, a week's journey from what was then the closest thing to civilization. New Hampshire is this state where the revolt against British rule truly began 
Never mind Lexington and Concord. Newcastle, am I right? <clears throat> On December 13, 1774, 400 citizens stormed Fort William and Mary in Newcastle, New Hampshire, beginning the American Revolution. <clears throat> New Hampshire was the first colony to declare independence from the United Kingdom. New Hampshire is the state whose constitution safeguards the right to revolution, yeah. stating that the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power is slavish and absurd. Yeah. New Hampshire is the state whose constitution says that the state is sovereign and independent and that all powers not expressly delegated to the United States are reserved to New Hampshire. <laughs> but, but it's there. It's our, this, is, this is what's important though. This is why New Hampshire is welcoming us because it is in the DNA here. This is, this is our place. And that's, that's what some people don't understand. Right? I've, I've gotten some comments on my blogs from, uh, from uh, Statist Action New Hampshire. Uh, they call themselves Progressive Action New Hampshire. Go back where you came from. Well, where, I'm from New Hampshire. New Hampshire is where libertarians are from, right? New Hampshire makes libertarians. <laughs> New Hampshire is the state of General John Stark hero of Bennington, whose words echo down through the centuries, live free or die, death is not the worst of all evils. New Hampshire is the state where Nathaniel Rogers published one of the, the nation's most radical abolitionist papers, The Herald of Freedom. Now, New Hampshire did not quite vote for our best uh, post-Civil War president. You guys know who that is, right? Grover Cleveland, yes. <laughs> our, man, our, our man Grover uh, did well in New Hampshire, given that it was a staunchly Republican state. He did better here than all the neighboring states. Um, but New Hampshire did vote for the best president of the 20th century. You guys know who that is, right? Calvin Coolidge, yes. We voted for him. New Hampshire is the state of Governor Meldrum Thompson. You know who he is, right? Not a libertarian, but a staunch conservative. He repealed the state's income, sales, and capital gains taxes. He was the first New Hampshire politician to take the pledge against broad-based taxes. In fact, he was so anti-tax and so much a New Hampshire patriot that when Massachusetts tax agents came to scope out the parking lots of New Hampshire liquor stores to look for Massachusetts license plates, right? Massachusetts residents coming for the virtually tax-free alcohol here in New Hampshire. Uh, <laughs> he had those Massachusetts tax agents arrested. Now, not everything uh, Mel Thompson did was, uh, was good. He, for instance, advocated that the uh, New Hampshire uh, National Guard develop nuclear weapons. Uh, so <laughs> but, uh, you know, even his foibles are charming. Uh, <laughs> so Mel Thompson is classic New Hampshire, there's no doubt about it. Today, New Hampshire is the only state in the country, according to the Mercatus Index of Economic and Personal Freedom, it's the only state in the country to score well above average on both economic and personal freedom. <laughs> Apart from no sales or income tax, New Hampshire is a leader in school choice uh, nationally. It's also um, one of the states with the lowest incarceration rates in the country. And on, on top of it all, of course, it's uh, the only state in the country where if you're 18 or over, you make your choice about whether to wear a seatbelt or not. <laughs> According to uh, election statistics and campaign contributions, in terms of today, in terms of the highest percentage of libertarians 
in a state's population. Uh, New Hampshire is second and very close to the top state. Montana's number one. Uh, Montana's number one, but uh, that and these data are old, so I think <laughs> I think we're really number one, and I think the new data will show that. <clears throat> so, what about New Hampshire's future? I'd like to take a little tour of what I expect to happen in New Hampshire over the next 20 years or so. So thinking about how free state project movers are going to affect social change here in New Hampshire, I'm going to go quickly through some of these calculations. If, um, if you're interested in the details, uh, you can certainly check out my talk, which will be going up on, on YouTube uh, from New Hampshire Liberty Forum called New Hampshire 2035, where I actually go through the numbers and do all the dry academic stuff about where this comes from. Um, but my best estimate based on uh, past mover rates based on our first 1,000 project, which some of you may know about. My best estimate is that within the next uh, eight years, by 2023, we will have 6,000 free state project movers here in New Hampshire. <laughs> so let's think about it. If we get 6,000 movers or more, what is that going to do? What are we going to be able to achieve with that kind of activist leaven to enliven New Hampshire's native culture of liberty? What would change? Well, to figure this out, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of how I try to figure this out. I look at, across the states, I look at how many libertarians are in each state. And I've done measures of this looking at election statistics, campaign contribution statistics, and got and indi indicators of how libertarian each state is in terms of its public opinion. And then I look at how free each state is according to the Mercatus Index. And I look at the correlation between those. And I do find that actually um, more libertarians in a state means more freedom. <laughs> so we libertarians, wherever we live, actually are somewhat politically effective. Now, actually, I saw someone ask a question about this um, at uh, Jacob Hornberger's talk, and she said, well, there didn't seem to be a correlation, much of a correlation between number of libertarians in a state and freedom. And actually, there is. You just have to control for states' conservatism. So once you do that, uh, there there's is a strong correlation between how libertarian a state is in terms of its people and how libertarian it is in terms of its policies. Okay. So what we can do then, we get an equation, right? This equation expresses the relationship between how many libertarians there are and how free the state is. So we can just plug in estimates of how many libertarians we'll have by 2023 and figure out how free the state should end up becoming. And then try to figure out, well, what does that mean? Right, the regression equation will show us how freedom should change as New Hampshire libertarians grow. So what I do is I plug in the appropriate value for number of libertarians in 2023, assuming 6,000 free state project movers. And then the equation spits out a freedom value, and it tells us that freedom should increase by 100 points on the Mercatus Index. That doesn't tell you anything. 100 points. What does that mean? So what I did then, I said, well, how can I change policies in this data set to give us a 100-point increase, right, to give us just a sense of how much freedom we can expect in New Hampshire. I'm saying by 2035, right, that's, we get the movers in by 2023, they start to get active, um, laws start to change. We know that, that progress through the legislature can be tough, but it does happen. So let's say 2035 seems a reasonable time frame for looking at how the Free State Project will influence New Hampshire. So I'm gonna go through, go through some policies uh, to figure out um, you know, how we could get this kind of increase in freedom. What would that actually mean in people's lives? So I'm going to return to that. First of all, I'm going to look at a validity check. Um, are FSP movers actually increasing how libertarian the state is? Right? How, do we already see any evidence of that? So let's just take a look at some preliminary data, given how many people have moved here so far. Okay, so first I'm going to look at Ron Paul's performance in Republican presidential primaries in 2008 and 2012. Okay, so on the left-hand side here I've got Ron Paul's vote share in New Hampshire in 2008, Ron Paul's vote share in, in 2012, right, it was 8% uh, in, in 2008, went up to 23% in 2012. And now I want to compare that to other states. 
To do that, I have to adjust every state's vote share for the fact that the primaries were different in every state. There were different numbers of candidates, a different schedule, caucus versus primary. Ron Paul did better where you had a caucus rather than a primary. So I adjust all states' vote shares for that, and, and so we can have a consistent baseline where we can compare all the states. Um, so in 2008, nationally, uh, Ron Paul's adjusted vote share was 5.4%. And New Hampshire was 11.2%. In fact, New Hampshire was, on this adjusted measure, uh, Ron Paul's best state in 2008. Um, so that's about six points better than the national average that he did here. In 2012, Ron Paul did 17 points better than the national average here in New Hampshire. Now, between 2008 and 2012, anyone want to take a guess of how many FSP movers we got in the state? Four hundred. Four hundred. So only four hundred movers, and yet we see that New Hampshire has become much more pro Ron Paul than the rest of the country, right? So four hundred movers alone seem to be making a significant impact. Now let's look at Libertarian Party presidential vote performance. Now a lot of people, a lot of Libertarians don't even vote for the Libertarian Party in presidential races, but it's another way of looking at how Libertarian the state uh, is. And we see that um, in 2008, uh, New Hampshire gave 0.13 percentage point of the vote more to the LP candidates. We actually had two in 2008, two LP candidates on the ballot. And then in 2012, um, it was 0.17 percentage points higher. So even by this measure, New Hampshire has become more libertarian over this four-year um, time frame. And then finally, the last one shows a slightly different picture. This shows uh, Ron Paul and Gary Johnson contributions as a percentage of the state economy. So on the left hand, I've got uh, 2008 contributions. And I show that in... Um, the country as a whole, people gave 0.12% of their income to Ron Paul. That's actually a lot. If you think of 0.12% of the economy was given to Ron Paul. Um, in New Hampshire, though, it was 0.33%. Uh, and New Hampshire was the number one state for Ron Paul contributors in both 2008 and 2012. In 2012, um, New Hampshire's advantage over the rest of the country declined slightly. I actually have a, a theory about this about why this indicator uh, suggests something slightly different from the other two. Um, in 2008, I don't know if some of you remember, but Free Staters had a big campaign here because uh, there was a guy doing, um, remember back to the money bombs in 2007, there was a guy doing a Ron Paul charts.com or Ron Paul graphs.com, and he was pulling contribution data off the official Ron Paul website and mapping Ron Paul contributors per capita by state. And Free Staters got all excited. Oh, we have to be the number one state for Ron Paul contributors on this guy's math. And so there's a huge campaign to get everyone to contribute something, anything, to Ron Paul's campaign. So I think that drove up our numbers in 2008 and might, might foul things up a bit here. But regardless, uh, you know, ignore that special pleading. If you like, two of the three indicators suggest that the f about 400 movers who moved between 2008 and 2012 increased libertarianism. So there's a suggestion that already New Hampshire is becoming more libertarian in terms of its voting and campaign contribution uh, statistics. So let me draw you a picture now. New Hampshire is becoming more libertarian. That's going to make our laws more libertarian. Just how much more free are Granite Staters going to be? Well, let's find out. Remember, I'm trying to add, get change policies until I get to a 100-point increase in freedom on the freedominthe50states.org index. All right, so New Hampshire 2035, what's it going to look like? So first, let's get, just go ahead and give New Hampshire the lowest tax burden in the U.S. at 7.5% instead of 8% of income. All right, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, that sounds nice. Uh, but you know what? We're almost there already. Uh, <laughs> the latest data show that New Hampshire's tax burden is already down to 7.6% of, in of income. Uh, so taxes and spending have been cut in New Hampshire, particularly in the 2011-2012 uh, um, legislature. So uh, we're already most of the way there. Let's go ahead and cut government debt in half. Yeah. 
Let's cut government employment by 15%. Let's go with Alaska Kerry. The legislature's already passed it. We just need a new governor. She says she's going to veto it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> it costs $10 for the license. It's not a huge burden, but uh, yeah, let's, let's just throw that on top of the heap. Let's go ahead and just legalize pot. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah, we need a new governor for that too. How about no more sobriety checkpoints? Restore the, the Fourth Amendment here in New Hampshire. Why not legalize prostitution while we're at it? I mean, my wife's here. I'm not going to do that, just so you know. <laughs> but consent... <laughs> I'm sure we can get volunteers who will... <laughs> Consenting adults and all that. How about tax credit scholarships for school choice? Oh wait, that already happened. <laughs> uh, let's completely deregulate private and home schools while we're at it. No state has done this, by the way, so we're, we're trotting into new territory. Um, let's abolish civil asset forfeiture. There's a bill and study committee that would do that. So let's, uh, let's make that happen in the next year or two. Let's go with the lowest incarceration rate in the United States. How about no more state or local arrests for victimless crimes at all? <laughs> and believe it or not, we're still not done. <laughs> Let's repeal the smoking bans. Let, let businesses decide property rights. Let's cut tobacco taxes to the US average. Hey, if, if, a if a land use regulation destroys the value of your property or reduces the value of your property, let's require compensation for that regulatory taking. Let's end exclusionary zoning. Let's get rid of minimum lot sizes and building cap permits and everything else. <laughs> building permit caps. Yes, I mean, we can have impact fees if you build a new development. Yeah, you pay for your road. But, uh, but let's let people build what they want on their own property. Let's let employers opt out of mandatory workers' compensation coverage. Right? That's Employees and employers can negotiate that. Hey, let's go ahead and, and somehow withdraw from Obamacare. <laughs> I don't know exactly how, but we've got 20 years. We can <laughs> there is that. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, let's go ahead and, and once we've done that, we'll abolish all health insurance regulation beyond just the, the minimal stuff. You have to file with the, with the state office, right? So no more uh, mandatory benefits, no more price controls, uh, you know, no, no more um, limits on what you can con contract and agree to with your insurer. Let's go with full table and telecom deregulation. You can choose between any full package video provider statewide that you want. Uh, let's end most occupational licensing. <laughs> willing buyers, willing consumers. Uh, no more abusive class actions. Let's go with, with tort reform. Let's uh, repeal the certificate of need law for hospital construction. Yeah, that's, that's already done too. Uh, effective early next year. <clears throat> and now we're done. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, yeah, we're reducing to the lowest national tax burden. Yeah, so the, yeah that, that's a big part of it. Um, yeah, and by the way, that, that's what I expect to happen. This is what I expect to happen in New Hampshire. 
This is not pie in the sky. This is not what I want to happen. This is not my fantasy. This is what the model suggests is likely to happen. Now, these specific policies, no. But the, these specific policy changes give you an idea of the quantity of the increase in freedom that we should expect to see in New Hampshire because of the Free State Project. Right? So we might do even better on some dimensions uh, than, than some of these. Yeah. What's that? Legal tender laws. Yeah. See, that's not even in our data set because no state has dealt with that yet. But we can start. I think that's the next frontier, right? Once we start being the freest state on every measure, uh, then, we, then we can start dealing with this other stuff. Okay, so some obligatory caveats. Um, st the statistical models suggest that libertarians are actually more influential over personal than economic freedom issues. So maybe shift all of that even more toward the personal freedom side. I mean, legalizing pot and prostitution, and, and it seems pretty, uh, a lot of personal freedom there, but, uh, but imagine even more personal freedom. Um, and also, we are extrapolating beyond anything observed in recent history. I mean, if 6,000 Free State Project movers move here, that is, New Hampshire will be by far the most libertarian state by an order of magnitude. Right? We don't know exactly what, what's going to happen as a result of that. There's a lot of uncertainty here. The federal government can be a barrier. Right? We might have to deal with that. Um, and all of this assumes that libertarians, that we libertarians can exert influence over broader society. And that depends on what we do once we get here. Right? If we're good neighbors, if we work with people, if we bring good solutions that make people's lives better to the table, then we're going to, going to win. <laughs> all right, so let's have a little bit of a gut check. Are we on track? I mean, these, these are huge changes. Well, over the last four years, what kinds of changes have we seen in New Hampshire? Are we on track to actually re the, reach this 100-point increase in freedom? Well, let's take a look. I think so. We have enacted a scholarship tax credit law for school choice for private schools, getting kids out of the government schools and into private schools. We have uh, cut taxes and spending now to the third lowest level in the U.S. We've repealed that certificate of need law. We've enacted medical marijuana. This is all in the last four years, just so you guys know. Now, a lot of people have been frustrated with the progress of marijuana reform in New Hampshire. Uh, we've, we've gotten bills, really good bills, passed the New Hampshire State House, and you know, it ends up either getting vetoed by a bad governor or a parliamentary outmaneuverings in the Senate. Um, but let's, let's look at the bigger picture here. States that legalize medical marijuana or decriminalize marijuana are overwhelmingly either liberal states or states with a citizen ballot initiative, right? New Hampshire is the most conservative state, right, by standard measures of conservatism, like presidential vote share. New Hampshire is the most conservative state in the country without a ballot initiative to have a medical marijuana law. If decriminalization passes, it's on the table right now in the Senate, it'll probably be picked back up and, uh, and may well get enacted into law. If that passes, New Hampshire will be the most conservative state without the ballot initiative to have real marijuana decriminalization. Uh, Mississippi supposedly has it, but actually they let local governments criminalize possession, uh, so they don't really have it. And New Hampshire is the only state in the country, no matter how liberal, to pass recreational marijuana through a legislative chamber, right? <laughs> so cannabis reform is, is coming to New Hampshire. It's just a matter of time. And that's all with just 800 to 1,500 movers, depending on when you count, all right? So what about when we get 6,000 movers? Can you imagine? So what would all these changes mean? What would New Hampshire look like in 2035? Well, our constitutional rights would be protected. We'd have a secure right to privacy, uh, a, a, secure, a right to security in our, in our person, in our property, in our, in our effects. Um, property rights would be protected. Uh, we'd have consumer power. Consumer choice would cause businesses to cater uh, to uh, what the customer wants. Right? So if we repeal smoking bans, non-smokers like me can vote with our dollars uh, to, uh, for, for non-smoking businesses. 
There'll be no more rent-seeking, corruption, or insider power. No more uh, competitors, uh, businesses keeping out their competitors by force of law. They'd have to compete on an even playing field. We'd have the New Hampshire way, the New Hampshire way again. Freedom, choice, competition, innovation, and tolerance. So what did, the, uh, what did the status say to the libertarian? I'm sure someone can guess this. <laughs> Who will build the roads? <laughs> what did the libertarian respond to the statist? <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> Flying cars, anyone? So with that, I'd like to say, welcome to New Hampshire, welcome to Porkfest, welcome home. Any questions? <laughs> Jason, all right, thank you, Jason. Can you go back to the beginning about um, how we're on the trajectory to get to 6,000 movers and um, the progress and when we'll get there, please? Yeah, this is gonna take a while. <laughs> is there a home we're, key? We're at how many right now, 16, 1,700? That's so right. How do, how do we get between uh, from now to, uh, 6,000 and how fast. Yeah. So the numbers are based on looking at the, uh, the first 1,000 project where depending on how you count our success rate for the first 1,000 project, it was between 30 and 40% yield of people who signed who actually moved within the next year. So I'm assuming that uh, once we hit 20,000, we'll get about 30%. This is very conservative. The 30% will actually move. So we'll get 6,000. Now, how do we, how do, we do that? Um, well, we, I, I think a lot of it uh, depends on us who are already here. Right? Why did the Free State Project keep going uh, back in 2004, 2005 when you know, we were down around 4,000 signers and it looked like 20,000 was a long way off? Uh, it, and it was kind of it was a little bleak at times. We worried, what, is this going to work? But people started moving and they started getting active and things started happening and Porkfest started growing and people would come and say, I want to be a part of this. And that's how it started building and snowballing. And the mover rate has already increased. Right? It's increased in the last, uh, the last three years, the mover rate has been the highest that it ever has been for us. So we just need to take it another, to another level. And I think that's going to happen. The more freedoms we create here, the more organizations we create here, um, the more opportunities for people to get involved to show that uh, this is actually working. We, we'll just be a model for the rest of the nation. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna tr trigger the move in the next couple of years, and then we're, we're gonna say, hey, come be a part of this. It's not, it's not actually a sacrifice, because you're gaining an entire community, right? You're gaining a, a support network that you probably don't have where you are right now. So I saw this talk at, uh, at Liberty Forum, and I like it now just as much as I did then. Um, my question is, one of the, your points, uh, I'm a little bit confused about why it's good, and I'd like to know what you think. Um, so it's the you, tort reform, no more abusive class action lawsuits, and I think in February you mentioned something about Delaware, but my memory might be faulty. So. Why do you think that reforming that is a measure of increasing liberty where in my, like from my limited knowledge, it's more of, um, of making companies take responsibility for things that they do? 
And am I correct in thinking that you want something more like Delaware, or am I imagining that? And um, how do you classify abusive? Because that seems really subjective. So yeah. those are that's like my three-part question. Good, good question. And uh, in principle, the tort system could be a tool for liberty, uh, as much as again. So we have to look at the evidence. How does the American tort system actually work? And the fact is that American tort costs as a percentage of the economy are much higher than any other industrialized country. Now, are we getting something from that? Some say, well, we're getting less regulation as a result of that. There's a, a study from the, uh, there's a recent book called The American Illness, Essays on the Rule of Law by a friend of mine, uh, Frank Buckley, who's a law professor at uh, GMU. Uh, it's an edited volume, he's the editor. And one of the studies in that book shows that states that have more regulations on business also have higher tort costs. So it's not as if we're getting out of regulation by substituting court, the court system for it. In addition, there's a study by um, uh, Alexander uh, Tabarak and El Eric Hellman that looks at um, uh, how out-of-state defendants compare to in-state defendants. And they find that in the states with the most politicized judiciaries, where judges are actually elected on a partisan ballot, out-of-state corporations uh, pay on average $300,000 more in a lawsuit than an in-state corporation. Now, are out-of-state corporations that much more abusive that they need to pay that much more? I doubt it. I think this is more, we're going to get that guy because they don't vote here. And so there really does seem to be a problem. In securities class action lawsuits, for instance, there's a whole cottage industry of, of lawyers who, as soon as a company stock goes down, they'll just file a lawsuit and say, there must be some fraud there. Your stock went down. And, uh, and they'll demand... All all sorts of corporate documents. It's very expensive to comply uh, with the dis even just the discovery process. And so what corporations will do is just um, settle. You know, here's $10 million, go away. And the problem with that is that it ends up being a kind of tax on the economy. And the, and the studies of this seem to repeatedly show that, um, that the American tort system is uh, um, excessive in certain areas, especially the class action area. Uh, that it, it just, um, we're not getting the bang for the buck. So in principle, I agree with you. In practice, it looks like uh, these systems don't work very well. Um, Delaware is very highly rated by business. I don't necessarily want to copy the Delaware model, but uh, let's find a way to, um, to, to make the, the system work well. Uh, for instance, we could uh, restore mens rea. Right now, for product liability, for instance, you can, uh, be, you can ha be held liable even if you did all due diligence to make your product safe. Just because someone did something bad with it. Uh, it's called strict liability. So let's get rid of strict liability maybe. Let's, um, let's make loser pay so we don't get frivolous suits. So things like that I think are actually a, a net increase in freedom. I just have two quick questions. As a very early mover, 10 years ago, uh, I would like to ask everyone else, the question from an early mover is, what are you waiting for? <laughs> and what did every free stater, free state friend, pre-stater, et cetera, say to Jason Sorens? Thank you. <laughs> Right and back at you. <laughs> Jason, I think all of your um, so-called reforms that are possible are definitely possible. It seems kind of conservative by 20, <laughs> 2035. I mean, that's um, some of the, like one of them, um, you said get rid of Obamacare and allow the states to eliminate all health care regulation. I mean, there's already something out there called the health care compact. It's an interstate compact that does exactly that. That's exactly what it does. There's tens of thousands of pages of federal regulation and they, the state can remove all of them. And there's other things. I'm sure we're going to accomplish all that and much more. So don't worry. <laughs> OK. I, li I like the idea of the compact. It does need to be ratified by Congress. So, But it might happen. I just had a question on you were talking about the incarceration rate. New Hampshire has one of the lowest mm -hmm. in the country, I believe you said. Yeah. Um, with the prisons they, they build in northern New Hampshire and Berlin. They built a state prison and, and a federal prison. Are you not looking at the federal numbers because they ship those people around? That's right. This is uh, state and local prisoners, uh, either in prisons or in county, you know, local jails. Um, 
which I think is appropriate, right, because we can't control the feds locking people up, and if they want to build a prison here, it's hard for us to stop that. We can try, but, um, you know, that's up to them. So it only includes what the state government is doing. Hi, Jason. Uh, you spoke about voting and the kind of electoral results from libertarians in New Hampshire, the Ron Paul contributions, the Gary Johnson contributions, and you spoke to the kind of political advancements that you can expect in 20 years. Uh, but I'm curious, what do you think, of, uh, what do you expect as far as specifically anarchist advancements in 20 years? Yeah, I, uh, I work with the political data because it's data. Uh, I like having data. It helps discipline us. Make sure we're not getting too pie in the sky. Um, and so elections are easy for that. Um, yeah, so for anarchist successes, I guess, um, you know, it's hard for me to say, I mean, what's the metric? Um, X number of gray market or black market businesses or agorist businesses. We can't count that because they're not, they're not um, you know, reporting to anybody. So it's hard to say here's a specific prediction about what's going to happen. I'm sure there's going to be lots of stuff happening in the extra political realm in education and civdis and agorism and so on. It's just hard for me to come up with a metric, but if, if you've got ideas, um, I'd love to, to try measuring that across states and that would be really interesting to see if uh, New Hampshire's a leader. Hi. Um, what first got Juan Paul interested in politics was when we got off the gold standard and it what got me first interested in politics is economics and taxes and it was a statement made by an elitist saying give me control of the money and I don't care what laws you make mm -hmm. um, I'd like to know what priority you put on uh, legalizing competing currencies and abolishing the legal tender laws. Thank you. I think it's extremely important. Um, you know, to some extent, we're, st we're entering a world with competing currencies. You can buy gold, you can buy other currencies, um, and that's not too difficult, but we should abolish legal tender laws, and, and more importantly, we need to, um, we need a monetary policy rule so that uh, the, the Fed isn't unconstrained and doing whatever it wants with monetary policy. Um, so we need that, and that, that would be critical to dampening the business cycle. Bec and, and that's important to freedom in, in one way, because whenever we get a Great Depression or a Great Recession, it turns people away from markets. And they think that capitalism has failed, and they start thinking, oh, we need to, you know, it's all the 1%'s fault. Well, no, it's the Fed's fault. Uh, let's put let's put blame where it's due, and and solve that issue. So I, I think once we solve that, we're going to have um, a long run brighter future for liberty. Thank you, Jason, for this wonderful projection, and you just gave me a huge dose of energy to keep going and do more and volunteer more. So I thank you, and I appreciate this analysis. It really is helpful. And uh, to my question, um, you said that we influence New Hampshire, we already have, and we have, we have contributed in so many ways to New Hampshire, politically and otherwise. My question is, how do we do it? How have we been doing it already? How, how have we done it? So, and we'll do it. So, really, my question. Um, we participate in the political process, and we get elected, and, and we win this way. What else do we do that help us change New Hampshire to be more libertarian? Education. Uh, so lobbying and running for office and supporting candidates can only take you so far um, if the voters ultimately reject those candidates and if there's a backlash against you. So uh, what I'm working on, I'm going to take the opportunity to pitch some of what I'm doing, which is um, Ethics and Economics Education of New England, uh, e3ne.org. You can check us out online, and we are um, we're educating high school students. I'm also working at Dartmouth to educate college students on moral philosophy and economics, and we're doing conferences for policymakers on state-level policy issues, bringing in national experts from left and right who support free market solutions in areas like uh, zoning, occupational licensing, forfeiture reform, uh, pension reform, and so on. 
and just educating legislators and journalists and, sh and showing them that these solutions actually work. Uh, the experts are actually pretty unified that we need to move in a market-oriented direction here. And, um, and I think we'll get some, some big results there. But we have to, it's a, it's a battle for hearts and minds. So a number of the um, advancements that you listed uh, are effectively nullifications of federal law. Um, uh, marijuana, for instance, and uh, Obamacare. Are there other trends that you see taking the form of nullification? And is there a point at which uh, you would say beyond which, in order to achieve greater liberty, would necessarily have to take the form of non-compliance? Um, and is there a wall that we're going to hit with the federal government that would lead no other alternative but independence. Yeah, I, I think we need to get powers back from the federal government. Um, we need to... Let's get out of Medicare and Social Security. Uh, let's, let's do that at the state level. Let's get out of um, Homeland Security, the drug war, the ATF, you know, and the laws that, that authorize their activities. Let's get all that done to the, at the state level. Whether that requires independence or not is another issue. I like to talk about self-government, New Hampshire self-government. What does that mean? It might mean independence, it might mean something less. Do we need to control foreign policy? Do we need a New Hampshire military and New Hampshire diplomatic missions abroad? Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, if we can get whatever we want in terms of domestic policy through self-government, uh, then let's try that. I, think, I just think it's... Um, it's a little bit more of an inclusive concept. I know you're working on independence, but I think self-government is a little bit more of an inclusive concept and, and might bring more people in who are scared about terms like secession. <laughs> you meant it. So as you know, there are some people in New Hampshire that are not happy that there's a free state project and of all places, they freaking chose New Hampshire. They have websites, they have Facebook groups, they're real people. What? What, what is our message for these folks? Well, our message is twofold. Um, we're fighting for their freedom too. Right? And what distinguishes us from the statists is that we're not uh, upset that different people, that, that progressives and conservatives have different preferences or different lifestyles from us. That doesn't upset us. We're not trying to force them to live our way. Um, we want them to have all the choices that we want for ourselves. What we're concerned about is more people being able to achieve their life plans. Sounds pretty great to me. Um, so we're not taking away anyone's freedoms or anyone's rights. We're doing quite the opposite. Uh, but second of all, New Hampshire is the libertarian state. If you just look throughout our history, we're the libertarian homeland. We're the, we're the people who are most in tune with the founding principles of this state, our state constitution, um, our political history. So uh, there's no case to be made that we're trying to change New Hampshire from something that it isn't. We're just trying to apply the New Hampshire way more consistently. This is sort of following on what Mayrav asked, but that was at the legislative level, like House of Representatives, maybe even Senator, right? That's what most people think about. But, but local politics could be important too, and it gets at a point that I, I don't think you address directly here. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, so I'm on the school board in Croydon, as you know, and we have this school choice thing going on uh, with private schools and the state is challenging us. And they're you know, having their interpretations of the law, so it's the rule of man, not the rule of law. If more local places were doing this, get on your local school board, then you can also, hey, what does the law actually say? And let's carry this through. I mean, I feel like we're winning, right? right? Based on this rule of law. Are you, no, I have a sort of follow-up question for you. Are, what's the, the latest on the Croydon situation? Are you gonna stand on your, on oh, your rights? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. The town's behind us. <clears throat> The town is willing to hold back funds from the SAU who is unwilling to pay because they're waiting for the state to interpret the law for them. The superintendent has a law degree and she won't read the law and make a decision. She's afraid of something. So are you going to have to sue her? No, I'm, we're not suing anybody. Okay. We're going to pay our own private school bills while yeah. they pay our public school bills as we go through the process of pulling out of the SAU. Oh, I see. See? Yeah, good for you. Yep, so that's what we're doing. And we have RSAs to back everything that we're doing. So, um, no, yeah, everybody's all for it. 
Yeah, right. Except for that small minority in town who think public money should only be used for public schools. Yeah. Well, New Hampshire law is actually pretty good, and we just need to have it enforced in, in a lot of areas. I mean, New, Ham New Hampshire is one of the few states whose constitution does not mention government schools. There's no mention of government schools in the, in the New Hampshire constitution. Two places, actually. Well, it's... it's Article 83. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. it's... Uh, you should cherish public schools. Sorry, nope. You shall cherish the, the legislature and the magistrate shall cherish seminary and public schools. And then two sentences later, it says you can't raise money for seminary. So then how the hell can we be raising money for public schools? Because cherish <laughs> means one thing that you should apply to both. Right? Oh, man, would I love to argue that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder what they originally meant by public schools, if they meant government operated or they not. Meant, I don't think they did. They, they meant Protestant-run schools. Seminaries right. were the Catholics. Right. I learned that from an IJ guy, Institute for Justice. He gave me the whole history. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Join us. <laughs>